Hello, fellow travelers, and welcome to another episode of the Versus Stars podcast third season. How are my loyal listeners? Thank you for your continued support. This is an amazing episode because J.M. DiMatteis returns to the mothership to discuss Spider-Man, Shadow of the Green Goblin from Marvel Comics. Now, come on board as we are traversing the stars. Hi, Mr. DiMatteis. Thank you so much for coming back to the Versus Stars podcast. Happy to be back. It's an absolute honor to talk with you, sir. You're obviously one of the legends of comic books, so thank you so much for doing this for me. You're very welcome. So you're now the writer of Spider-Man and Shadow of the Green Goblin. So how do you get involved with the project and what, which aspect of the series intrigued you the most? Well, you know, I've been doing, uh, uh, this is, I think, the third recent Spider-Man miniseries I've done. The first was the Ben Riley. The second one was The Lost Hunt. So I've been getting into a rhythm with my editor, Danny Chasm, and we just, you know, we're always looking for the next thing. And we were talking and and I'm fascinated by that period in Peter's life when being Spider-Man was really something new. I did a couple of stories some years ago, really in that same time period. It's like we're, we're talking about just like within a month of Uncle Ben's death when he finally realizes he's going to go out there and try to be a hero. And, you know, when I was 12 reading Spider-Man, Peter Parker seemed really old to me. Now I look and I'm looking at this is a 15 year old kid at this point in time, you know, mm. A 15-year-old kid suddenly with the, with this burden of grief on his shoulders with these powers, he has no clue what he's doing. Uh, and, you know, he and Aunt May are still, in, still you know, in grief over Uncle Ben's death. And it's to me, it's, it's a chance to explore corners of Peter's psyche that I have. You know, a lot of the, the, the eras of Spider-Man I've done and I've gotten in there and I've really explored a lot. This is an area where there's a lot more room for me to play and explore. So that, that's really, really fun for me. And then, of course... We've got the Osborne family at that same era, and the, I, you know, I've spent a lot of time digging into the deep dysfunction of the Osborne family. And this, we get to do this at, from a new angle that I've never explored before, and uh, the same, so slightly lesser degree, but the Stacy family is in there as well, and their struggles because Gwen's mother is dying at this point. Uh, so we get to go in there, and it's really a family saga more than anything. It's all about these three families dealing with their grief and their struggles and then we have all the fun superhero slam and bang layered on top of that so i think one of the interesting things that you did or choices that you made to write this comic book is that you have the older peter parker looking back and basically narrating the story of him being young so basically having that two perspectives the, the 15 year old parker and then the much older i assume he's almost in his late 20s early 30s by that point um, I, in my mind, when he's narrating this, he's even older than that. He's older than he, he might be fifty when he's looking back. Okay. At this. Yeah. It's so, I, you know I I love Dickens and I love you know David Copperfield's my favorite Dickens and I always love that narrative thing of someone looking back on their life from a distance because when you have that distance, you see things very differently. Hmm. You know, if this was being narrated by Peter when he was fifteen, you got a completely different story. You hmm. know, but but you know if I'm telling you a story now about something happened to me when I was fifteen. Even if it was traumatic, I have a very different perspective. I might even be able to look at certain things with with humor that I couldn't look at when I was in the middle of it. So I, I like having that perspective and that distance. Um, so that's that's another element that has added a lot of fun to this story for me. And the, the other thing too is as we grow older, our voice does change, um, and, and how you know how we speak, how we think, how we approach things. So how have you had to approach writing an older Peter Parker? And then writing the younger 15 year old Parker and having their voices being different enough that you can tell, you know, this is a, the wiser, older voice. This is the younger 15 voice. You know, it's it's nothing that I have to really think about. It's really more intuitive. <clears throat> Peter is someone that, you know, I've been writing Spider-Man on and off since the early 80s. This is someone I know very intimately through every through every era of his life, you know. Uh, I, I've often said I know Peter better than I know a lot of my closest friends because I live inside his head. Yeah. We have mer we you know the writer and the character kind of merge their psyches, and we create this this version of Peter Parker that's part me and part him. So I know him. So to 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 slip into young Peter's voice and then go back to older Peter's voice very easy for me. I did a story years ago. I I forget which book in Web Spinners. Uh, it was a Mysterio story, but I used the same device. It was Peter looking back on these events. And I, again, 
it, it just gives you that wonderful distance and a little little bit of wryness to throw in there as well. Uh, so it was very easy for me to slip into the different voices and the different the different head spaces that he's in. And I think another um, interesting writing technique that you use that you have Peter Parker saying some of the story is from un unsubstantiated rumors. Some of it is based on evidence that I've been able to collect over the years. Because obviously, he, he, being his perspective, you can't be in everyone's head everywhere. Cause right. You're, you're the narrator. Right. Um, so when you're thinking about stuff that may or may not be substantiated, things that he may be kind of just piecing together, how does that create um, a different aspect of telling the story? Well, you know, it's one of the things that just fascinates me in life is memory. You know, you and I could probably walk away from this conversation five minutes later, write down our version of events and they'll be different. You know what I mean? Yes. And even if you have a transcript of every word we're saying, your interpretation of how I'm saying it to you and my interpretation of how you're saying what you're saying to me can be wildly different. Mm. And then as time goes by, you know, our memories, we think we're remembering this and it happened then, but it really happened two months later, you know, or, or you know. I love, you know, I'm a big Beatles fan. So, you know, you, I, I read all these books and everybody's perspective. Well, Lennon said this happened. McCartney said this happened. No, I wrote this part. No, I wrote They're not lying. You know what I mean? It's yeah. just memory. So and I, I, for me, it's like in life and in, and in fiction, it's like you're trying to get to the essence of something, even if you know you're going to get the details wrong. And that's Peter understands that. So he's not trying to claim that this is exactly how it happened because even if he was trying to write it exactly how it happened he'd get something wrong you know mm. and it also <laughs> as so, someone pointed out in review and i wasn't thinking about this it's a great way to kind of jump over any continuity uh glitches that might happen when you're trying to jump into a story like that because it's well don't blame me it's peter's memory you know <laughs> but it's but it's true you know so if, oh really so this didn't happen on monday it happened the following thursday in a different issue of you know doesn't matter this is this is the way he remembers it this is the emotional and psychological truth of those events because he is the narrator and he's dealing with a lot of different characters that he obviously isn't because he's not norman osborne he's not harry osborne um is there an inherent bias on how he's presenting the story because of what he knows of norm i mean yes obviously norman to him is always going to be the bad guy who killed gwen stacy did all these horrible things is the story can he tell the story completely without a bias he absolutely cannot and he and he and he knows that and he says that in the story you know um and he keeps returning every time he, talk, he talks about you know norman and the norman does something kind well was he really being kind i don't believe he could be kind he was probably just fake but maybe he you know he 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 himself is conflicted as he's looking back on this because when it comes down to the core of it, he just this man has done so many bad things that he can't really let go and forgive him. At mm. the same time, Peter being Peter, there's a part of him that wants to see a little deeper into Norman and believe that there was some humanity there. So he's conflicted, and so and again, that's one of my favorite things about writing anything is picking what's the point of view. You could have the same exact story. Same beginning, middle and end, same details, same events, but pick a different narrator and you can tell that story five completely different ways from the point of view of, of, of the person telling it, whether it's an omniscient narrator, whether you have someone who's a biased third party watching from over there, someone who's in the middle of it who often can't see it clearly either. So again, that's, the, that's one of the things that made this story fun for me was finding that point of view. And you're absolutely right. Peter cannot tell the story without bias. None of it. The way he views oh, Gwen is going to be a certain way because he loved her so much. The way he views Harry, um, and that that makes it interesting. And, and also, I like the way you just said about the idea that some things he can't let go, because you know it makes him so human. Because when you think of someone like Superman, he's always one hundred percent good, always sees the best. You know, he's like you know, but Spider Man to make him human, he can't let everything go. He even though he is that good guy, he wants to be a good guy that certain characters, even he can't get over his own dislike for, you know, his own distrust for. Yeah, and that's the thing about Peter. I mean, Peter is, at his core, a truly good and decent human being, but he is not some flawless, perfect guy. That's That was the, that was the magic of Spider-Man from the very beginning when they mm -hmm. created him, you know, is that he will screw up spectacularly and then he will feel guilty about it and he will try to write that wrong but he's human and yes he's he's you know he he's not going to necessarily ever get over the thing with norman completely and that's you know that's kind of true about us with life we have these 
these scars, these traumas, and we move past them to some degree. We grow past them to some degree, but the scar is always there. And if you look down and you see the scar, it brings back all those memories and all those feelings. And for Peter, it could be in his day-to-day -day life. It's interesting to think about. He doesn't even give Norman a second thought at this point in his life if he's a 50-year-old guy. Hmm. And in my mind, Norman's long gone, you know? Um, but then you think back to it. You know, think you even if you, you've been through therapy and you've worked through your trauma in some way, if you sit and you really go back in your mind and you think about that, that thing that really hurts you in your life, all that pain is going to come back with that memory in that moment. You may be able to let it go more easily than you did 20 years before, but it's always going to be there in some form. And no Norman is one of those you know primal traumas of his life. I think another interesting thing that you do with this story, and I find your story absolutely fascinating, is that you have a lot of um, foils, dramatic foils in the story. And part of the thing I was thinking about was, is you look at the relationship between Norman and Harry and then you have Aunt May and uh, Peter. Um, but you also have the, um, so you, in many ways, Harry and Peter are foils for each other for how they are the children of these, or how they're being parented by right. those in their life. But then you also have the idea of um, Norman versus Peter and how an idea of um, hero versus villain, how they handle their powers, their responsibility. Which do you think is the stronger foil? Is it Harry and Peter or is it Norman Green Goblin or in Spider-Man? In the big picture, not just in the story particularly, you mean in the big oh. picture? Oh. oh, you know, well, in the story, Norman's not really in the in, as the events are happening. Norman is not a foil for Spider-Man because Peter does not know who and what Norman really is at this point in time. Right. And so he's 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 going up against this this uh, proto goblin, as we call him, as the, you know, this, this is this obscure character that that appeared in one story. And my editor said, oh, you know, we could use that character. I thought, what a great idea to, to as a doorway into the to the Osbournes. So in Peter's mind, the narrator, Norman, is this big bad. But in the moment, Peter's trying to save Norman and save this guy's kid. He doesn't know really either one of them. He has no idea that Norman has manipulated the proto-goblin and done these terrible things to him. In the course of the story, he begins to see the proto-goblin differently and with more compassion, but he still doesn't know that Norman uh, is the one behind this. And... Um, in the big picture, I always found the Harry Osborne Green Goblin more interesting mm -hmm. for the simple reason that they were best friends, very best friends. These guys loved each other. And then they found themselves in a position where, you know, they simultaneously hated and loved each other. And the love was always there. So they could never kind of, how do we put it, consummate the hate because the love is always there, you know. And that just dramatically from a writing point of view, you know, you got these two guys locked like this and they, they can't let go because they love each other. They hate each other. And in the end, you know, when I when I did my spec run with uh, Sal Buscema, we see with Harry that the love won out in the end, you know, although it was a hard road to get there. And that to me is is makes for great, great melodrama and great drama, you know. And I think another interesting thing in the story you described, you explore too, is the idea of monsters. Um, obviously, on some level, um, Van Adder, who's Proto Goblin, becomes a monster, not necessarily of his own free will, but it happens. You have Norman, who's potentially is a monster. Um, in some way, I guess even um, Harry's uh, mother is on this kind of monster, how she, what she does. Um, how do you kind of explore? Well, let me go back a little bit. You also have the idea of Norman being mentally ill. So is he really a monster if he's mentally ill? Right. Um, you have, uh, like I said, you have Van Adder who's doing horrible things, but he's doing it for reasons that he wants to turn back so he can be with his family. Mm -hmm. So how are you exploring what it is to be a monster? And are they a monster if they do have these underlining problems that are causing them to behave that way? Right, right. And well, that's, you know, that's not just a great question for for a comic book story. That's a great question for life, isn't it? You know, right? Because some people are capable of doing truly, truly monstrous things, and then if we take a look at their past or their childhood, and you see what's what they've been through. Like, so we bring it back to Norman. You know, Norman had a very, very, very uh, dysfunctional is too small a word. Traumatic childhood, and Peter knows that, and that's one of the reasons why there's that push pull. You know. Mm -hmm. uh, that we see the little bit when his, his, you know, Norman's father locked him in this closet, and little little Norman's imagining these these goblins that are coming to torment him, you know, uh, which are basically just manifestations of his own father, and that haunts him for his whole life. And he wears this little in the story. I gave him this little goblin pendant to remind him of his childhood always, you know. So in a sense, when he does become the Green Goblin, he he's turning himself from a victim, you know. He's giving he's somehow in his mind giving himself power. 
For, mm. You know, I, I will, those goblins haunted me, but now I will become the goblin. So I will not be a victim anymore. Um, so on one level, you, you know, yes, they are monsters. You know, uh, Norman is a monster, but really the flip side is when we look into their hearts, nobody's really a monster. Everyone, everyone is a victim in some way. Every monster, I can't say every, because you can't make a giant statement like that, but many monsters begin as victims and that's what turns them into monsters. And that's what also leaves the seed of maybe hope for redemption in them as well, if you can heal that. I also think there are some people I think in life that are just born, something's just wrong. There's a wire in their brain that just is never got connected. So it's not about them being traumatized. It's about them being ill in some way, you know, that they just, they, they, they just, like I said, the wire's not connected and they're, they're, they don't function the way the rest of us do. I can think of certain political figures that I would put into that category. Um, you know, and, and it's just, and, and they are monsters by biology, perhaps, you know, um, this is a fascinating subject. We, we could talk about it for hours, you know, Absolutely. but the reality is, you know, I think in the end, even though he wrestles with the Norman thing, I think Peter's perspective, at least what he tries to do, he doesn't always succeed. And I relate because it's the same thing with my life. You at least try to be compassionate and to understand these people. At the same time, when someone is being monstrous and hurting people, you know, you're always torn between that, like, get that fucker. And like, oh, I understand what 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 created this person and mm. what they went through and why they turned into this, you know? There's a thing in, uh, we want to get, really do a deep dive in the Bhagavad Gita, which is this great Hindu holy book. You know, they go to war, but the you're supposed to go to war with dispassion. You know what I mean? You're supposed to have be at, at a remove or, or, you know, they talk about having having compassion for your enemy. You still have to oppose that force. You have to stop the green goblins of the world but you you don't have to hate them while you're stopping them. You can acknowledge what they're doing is wrong and stop them. Well, intellectually, that's a, that's a really wonderful point of view. That's a hard thing to live and put into practice in your life. And I think Peter is someone who at the very may not succeed at that, but tries. He will always, you know, he will always err on the side of compassion. And I think another thing you did very interesting is that you have Peter Parker questioning if he is a monster because of his strength and his power. And you have, I can't remember the name of the, the character who he punches and sends to the hospital because he doesn't really right. like powerful, he can't control himself. And he starts wondering about himself in, in that way. So how does understanding Van Adder and Osborne help him understand his position as someone who does also, who has caused damage, but is trying to not be that? Right, it's all mirrors, right? It all reflects. And that's, you know, that, that actually came from a story that I did, I don't know, 10 or 12 years ago called The Punch where I was exploring that period of Peter's life. And this was like, suddenly, you know, if you and I suddenly we had this power, how do you control it? You don't know, you know, the, you know, the always thing in the, in the comics, well, I just checked my blow. So, you know, well, how do you check your blow when you have the power of Spider-Man? So in the original story, this, this, you know, this, this young guy, this probably not that much older than Peter is robbing a grocery store. Spider-Man goes in to save the day, goes like this, sends him flying across the store. The guy breaks an arm and a leg and cracks his ribs and ends up in the hospital. Peter's horrified. So when we pick him up in this story, he's afraid to do anything because what if I punch too hard and I kill this guy? Yeah. Um, and right, and then the question is, am I as much a monster as these people that I'm trying to stop? You know, because really, if you woke up one day with the power to crawl up walls and, you know, and have the strength, that incredible strength, it is kind of monstrous. And it's funny because I think about when I was a kid, the first time I ever saw a Spider-Man comic, I don't, it's at someone's house and I'd never pulled out this comic and it was Ditko stuff. He was the creepiest looking quote superhero I had ever seen. He looked like a monster to me, you know? Yeah. So, so there's always that thin line with the quote heroes as well. You know, you always have to put the villains and the heroes in quotes because basically they're all just people in their own weird way trying to do their best to survive in the world, you know? Um, so yes, and by, by having compassion for others, Peter has to learn to have compassion for himself. Mm. And also in terms of Uncle Ben's death, you know, there's one point in the story where he says, look, I know I was 15 at the time. I didn't know what I was doing. I can't carry that burden forever. And yet he carries that burden forever, even though a part of his brain knows it was just a kid doing his best at the time. Um, you know, he didn't know when that guy ran by him, the guy was going to shoot his uncle or that there would be any kind of ramifications. He was just, you know, a kid. But we, you know, we're not, we're never one thing or another, you know, uh, we're never all good or all bad, which is why I love writing the villains and finding, you know, the core of good in their hearts. And you love 
writing the heroes and finding the flaws in them because we're all such a mixture of those things. And that's what makes for great stories. And like I said, it, it, it's very interesting having um, Peter, like, then when he's fighting uh, the proto-goblin and he's kind of like, I don't know if I can hit him because I could kill this guy and basically getting pummeled because he's afraid to fight back. And I thought that was a very fascinating aspect of a superhero who's in the moment wondering, can I really... Should I really be fighting this guy? Because what if I actually hurt the bad guy? Yeah, no, it's true. And then that's why when he when he runs into the Sandman and realizes I can hit this guy and hit this guy, you know, it doesn't matter. He just goes poof and then puts himself back together. So he gets to unleash that a little bit. But then you know the twist there is both of them are like the Sandman's in the same boat that Peter is. You know, one day he's a regular guy, the next minute he's this weird thing that turns into sand, and they end up saying, you know, let's not fight. And they sit on a roof and they have a conversation both of them sharing how weird it is to be what they are, you know? And that's one of my favorite little bits in the story is that conversation between Peter and Sandman. Now, when you're thinking about, when you're developing the story and you have Van Adder as the proto-goblin, um, and obviously it's a part of the legacy of the Green Goblins that most fans, are, because they said they only appeared once, is, are not going to be very familiar with. Neither was I, to tell you the truth. <laughs> my, 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 if my editor hadn't pointed that out to me, I would have never known about it. So why is he the right overarching antagonist for this the story you're telling now about P parker at 15 well because it's you know we're talking about norman's evolution into the green goblin and that began with these experiments that he did and and van adder is the result of those experiments in in in, in trying you know in, in his evolution into the monster he's creating other monsters along the way but one of the realizations he has in the story is i will become the monster mm. but in the beginning van adder is the monster that he created um uh, so, in a way, Van Adder as the proto goblin is really just a reflection of Norman's own psyche and Norman's own desires. You know, to to in his mind really right the wrongs of his own childhood by becoming something stronger and bigger. But underneath that, Van Adder is just a guy. It's the same thing with Peter and Sandman and all this. You know, he's just this guy. He worked for this guy. He got suckered into doing this thing, and now he's this grotesque thing he can't see his wife he can't see his kids it's a it's a horrible situation that he's in and he ultimately the only reason he's doing what he's doing is is he's been promised that if he does this if he brings harry uh to uh i'm blanking on harry's mother's name yeah. uh to, to harry's mom um emily if he brings harry to emily uh, then and 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 takes out norman then he'll get to be normal again and get to be with his family again and we'll see by the by the last issue where that brings him and what decision he makes along the way. Um, I, I think that's interesting as well because the proto goblin uh, Van Adder had the opportunity to go the direction of Spider Man. You know, you have this power you don't want it, but you still can go about things in a more appropriate <laughs> way to try to live his life. Um, is that a weakness of his character, or is he stuck with faith that he had to go in that direction? Yeah, I mean, really, because it's not like he he chose to be a supervillain and he went out and started robbing banks or, you know what I mean, or trying to take over the world. Really, after this happened to him, he just laid low and then Emily showed up and made him this offer. So it wasn't a question of like, I'm going to go bad. It was a question of, oh, this is a doorway to get me back to my family and I will do anything to get back to my family, you know? So it's not like he... He, he made a decision to be a supervillain or anything like that. And I don't, you know, I don't see him as one either. He's just a guy in an unfortunate circumstance. If he is, was the stuff, let's say he killed Norman. Um, and, you know, that all, um, and I know this is more philosophical. Could he ever truly go back to the life that he had, having been now the person who murdered an individual who went down that path? Can he ever have just been like, all right, it's all good now. I'm back to normal, living my happy life and everything's good. Or would that already always be part of him? Right. I don't want to give away anything that happens in the last issue, although we, clearly we know he doesn't kill Norman. <laughs> that, would, that, that would be the twist ending, right? Well, Norman's dead and the other Norman is somebody else. No, but just, just from a philosophical vantage point, my understanding of the character, I don't think he would be able to live with himself. He could never go back to being, because it would have crossed a line for him mm. into something that would have changed him forever. How could he look his wife and his kids in the eyes? So I think another um, another line I really like is when you talk when you talk about um, the Osborne and Norman, and he's like, Osborne, Norman Osborne was a warning for the horrors to come. And I thought that's such a fascinating um, viewpoint that he kind of was like the, uh, not the proto-goblin, but Norman himself. It, it was 
like was the first salvo, salvo of what was going to be this <laughs> rough life that he lives. So yeah, like so, kind of explore the idea that he is kind of like the first exploration of some of the psychosis that he's going to be dealing with in his life, some of the horrors he's going to be dealing with in Spider-Man's life. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. You know, it's like Norman is like the, the the first toxin injected into the bloodstream, you know? So he mm. he's maybe he's fought, you know, one or two supervillains along the way, but he hasn't he hasn't come up against something so purely dark. Uh, and, and and even though at the time he doesn't really know what Norman is, looking back, he feels like just Norman's entrance into his life is like some toxin injected into his bloodstream. And that's one of the things I dealt with in the Lost Hunt story, because the premise of the Lost Hunt was from that period where Peter and Mary Jane went off to Portland and Peter had no powers. And once he's not Spider-Man anymore, he takes a step back and realizes what the hell he's been doing for the previous decade. The trauma that he's faced, the, the, the psychotic people that he's had to deal with. And he's traumatized by that, because he can't, before that moment, he couldn't really allow himself to see what he was facing, because if he did, he'd never go out there as Spider-Man ever again. Mm. Once he stops being Spider-Man, he's haunted by this, you know, and and, he, and he, in the last time he thinks about that, I was like, you know, I was 15 and look what I had to go out there and deal with. It's horrible. Uh, it's amazing. You know, it says it speaks to Peter's strength of character that he came through all that, that with his heart and his sanity intact. And the thing with um, Norman Osborn, when we think about Norman Osborn, everyone thinks, um, they killed Gwen Stacy, and he obviously had incredible level of damage to to Peter Parker. But you're suggesting that and to Harry, yeah, and to Harry, Harry. But you're suggesting the mental damage that he's done to Peter Parker, even without the Gwen Stacy part, just to cause Peter to exist in that darkness was actually potentially more damaging and destructive than what he, anything else he's done. Well, I don't know if we can separate it out from Gwen's death because it's all of a piece. And, you know, look at what he went through with Harry. He would not have gone through that with Harry had Norman not been so abusive to Harry and created that mental illness in Harry. Um, so, yeah. So, you know, so, you know, Norman is like, I think in his mind, this 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 dark shadow that just looms over everything, which is why he has such a hard time wrestling with that, letting go and finding any sort of forgiveness for it. Because it wasn't just Norman himself; it was the impact that Norman had on everything around him. Now, when you're writing Emily, she's—I feel like she's a very difficult character because you have to develop a character who would stay with Norman, given who Norman is. Was she a tough character to write? No, no, because you know I, that, that's the truth of a lot of abusive situations. A lot of people can't find their way out; they just can't. You know, uh, because on some level, maybe they think, oh, I deserve it. Or if I leave, what's going to happen to me? I won't be able to survive on my own. Now, she's, you know, she's married to this multi-gazillionaire guy. She's got this baby. When she first meets him, he seems incredibly charming and she falls in love with him. And the, and the deeper they she goes down the Norman rabbit hole, the crazier he gets and the more abusive he becomes. But even for her, finally, it reaches a point where she has to leave and, 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 you know, I think she has it in the back of her head that someday I'll come back for my son, but I have to I have to get out of here and take care of myself and then I'll come back. You know, and she knows that that, that if she takes Harry, he will hunt, he will hunt her down and, and destroy her. Even, you know, you know, she fakes her own death and all that, but she couldn't have, you know, faked Harry's death and her death. And, you know, she and she's not thinking clearly anyway. She well. just wants to get out of this abusive situation and it breaks her heart to leave Harry behind. And so to come back now, whatever it is, a decade later, no, more than that, because, well, you know, Harry, probably 15 years later, because Harry's about the same age as Peter, and she left maybe when Harry was a year old. Um, you know, it's she's hoping somehow to to allow, get Harry to understand what she went through and why she did what she did. And we will ultimately see in the final issue how Harry responds to that as well, you know? Uh, because it's it's really in the fourth issue that they have that they have their confrontation. Um, so you know she's just she's another you know in what you look at it one way everybody in this story is a victim in some way oh. shape or form, and and you know and that's the that's the the history of family dysfunction right it gets passed down to generation to generation to generation. Somewhere along the line, there's someone that, by the grace of God, has the the will uh, uh, to stand up and say, no, I'm not going to repeat what's been done to me. You know, it, it stops here, but it's hard. It's hard. And, and you know, we say that Emily um, and Norman both grew up with alcoholic fathers. I, I throw that in there. So she's, 
you know, when you grow up with abuse, you kind of think that's that's the norm in a way. You know, if you grow up in a dysfunctional family, you, you it, as a kid, you think everybody's dysfunctional. Every, it must be the same in every house, you know? And of course it's not, but you bring that that tape loop with you into her, into your life. So her, for her to accept what was going on with Norman up to a point is because that's what she knew her whole life. And finally it came to a breaking point and she just ran. Now, when you're, um, you brought up the idea, and Parker, Peter Parker brings up as well, the idea that when Norman was being the charming Norman, when he was wooing Emily early on, was that an act or not? As the writer, was that an act of his, or was that him, they, maybe within the, the mist of love, being able to control himself for at least a little while before he starts falling back to the old, to his old way? Right. Obviously. Go ahead, go ahead. Okay, I would say, because obviously in, in the midst of um, love, in the midst of the, the, the happiness, the glow of it, you may be able to constrain yourself for a little while, but not forever. Right. Exactly. Exactly. I don't think Norman could even answer that question. You know? So Peter will never be able to answer that question, because I think Norman himself, there's a part of him that's always manipulating everyone around him. I, I personally, however much Peter questions it, don't doubt that he loved Emily. At the same time, he is manipulative and and he will do anything he can to to get her and and ultimately to keep her under his thumb. You know, at the same time, he loves her. And and again, they get it, they have a confront confrontation in the in the last issue. So I don't want to say too much, but we'll see exactly what it is that Norman feels for Emily when we get to that final issue, which I guess comes out probably in a couple of weeks. So when you're, we also talk about monsters. Um, obviously, there's also the fact that Emily's a victim. Is she? Is there something monstrous about her as well for how she's playing out these events? Yes, we address that. I don't want you know. A lot of these things you're asking are addressed in the last issue, but she's been pushed to actions that she normally wouldn't take. That's all I'll say for now. And she has, she too has to face what she's done in the last issue. Because she's do, she's doing this out of love too. She wants her son back. She wants her son to know that she never stopped loving him. But what is she doing to achieve that goal? Is it monstrous? Is it not? We'll see in issue number four. <laughs> um. All right, so um. Let's see. We, we could dive into this part. Um. One of the themes of the story we talk about the theme of of, of, of being a monster. Things of um. One of the themes. Other themes is loss. Gwen Stacy and her mother, obviously we just deal with Uncle Ben and the fact that they're not dealing with the loss in, in many ways, I guess they're not dealing with it because they're not talking yeah, about it. Yeah, that's the problem. The biggest problem is that they are, they're they are each shoving it down because they think if they express their grief, it's going to somehow hurt the other person more. So Aunt, Aunt May is pretending, trying her best to pretend that she's okay. Peter's trying to pretend that he's okay. And neither one of them are okay in the least. But I will say, I'm just, I just put it in my head, it does give a great reason to explain how Peter Parker suddenly is getting bruised because if he's that upset, he's I guess that's on May's perspective going out there causing fights because he's angry. And it's a good way to explain the fact that he's not, you know, other than Spider Man saving people. I thought that was a, right. you know, a, a nice little connection right there. But, um, how does the story also connect to different facets of coping with loss and, and how you use the different characters and different storylines to develop the idea of um, how one copes? Yeah, well, th uh, that's really the, the main focus of the Peter Aunt May dynamic in this story, what we just talked about. How does one cope? Sometimes one copes by not coping, mm. you know, by pushing it all away, by pushing it down. Um, and sometimes we're doing it to, for, to survive for ourselves, or sometimes we're doing it because we think we're, we're, we're helping someone else by not expressing that grief. Um, and then, uh, you know, Gwen and her dad uh, dealing with... with um, her mother's imminent passing and you know gwen is the one who's very very hopeful and has to has to imagine that it's all going to be okay don't worry we're going to it's going to be good and you know her dad is smart enough to know uh there's there's at one point and i think it's in the third issue where they have the conversation where he says no gwen i don't have to be chipper i don't have to be smiley i don't have to hold on to hope i'm in grief and i have we all have to be able to express our grief there's nothing wrong with that in fact we need that to survive and then there's a level of loss with 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 you know, with Emily, because she's lost Harry. And there's a level of loss with Norman because he lost Emily. Hmm. You know, in his mind, his wife died all those years before. And however monstrous may he may have been, as we said, he loved her. So there's a level of loss there as well. And Harry with the mother that he never knew. 
So they're all dealing with loss in one way, shape, form, or another. And of course, Van Adder, who has lost his family because of what Norman did to him. Is there any of these characters who's handing, handling loss in a way that you consider healthy? Well, you know, I don't remember. Do Peter and, and Aunt May have a, a healthy conversation in issue number three? I think they do. Um, towards the end, they start having, they do have that conversation. Yeah, um, so that's the, that's the beginning where the two of them begin to really handle it in a, in a healthy way. And, 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 and we see them take, because, you know, you don't just have one conversation and we're healed, but they take, they take the first step and we can see that they are going to work this through in a way that is, that is healthy for them. Um, I think Norman and Harry, unfortunately, are incapable of dealing with life stresses in a healthy way. They just are. They can't. Uh, Gwen and her dad, yes, they will work through this in a healthy way. And don't forget that that Harry and Gwen are best friends. And they will be there. Harry can, can be there in a healthy way for Gwen because she's his best friend and he loves her. And she will be there for him as well. Uh, so you get the contrast, you know, uh, Van Adder, unfortunately, because of who and what he is. But again, I don't want to give away the ending, you know. Uh, I know what's going to happen to Van Adder, but I don't want to tell you. So is the next issue the final one? Yeah. Of the series? Um, mm -hmm. Is there is it final with continuations or is it final final? It's it's final. But what I'd like to do is is throw a little breadcrumbs in there that might lead to another story down the line. You know, but it's very much you're getting a complete story. We're not, you know, it's not like these. It's not like it's the end of the season and we and we're hanging there. You know, it's the end of the story and it's and it's and it is resolved clearly. But they really always want to leave a thread or two because you know when you have an interconnecting universe like Marvel, sometimes you leave the thread and you think maybe I won't write the story, but maybe someone else will pick up on it hmm. and return to that. You know, so there is there 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 are a couple of threads there, and of course. You know, the fun of this story also is we as readers, because we're Spider-Man fans, we know there are lots of threads there that are going to play out over the next however many years in all the Spider-Man comics to come. So what's next for you? Ah, oh, there's a lot. Let's see. I have uh, coming out in July. Well, the first big thing, the big, the biggest of the big is uh, is the second Kickstarter for what I'm calling the Demultiverse. Uh, we did this about a, maybe a little over a year or so ago, year and a half. We we launched five new comics on Kickstarter, five new comics, five different artists, five different genres. Uh, we called it the Demultiverse as the umbrella, umbrella title through my friend David Baldy, who created an imprint called Spellbound Comics just for these books. And what we did was we put those books out and the people that supported the campaign got to vote on which book they wanted to see continue. And what got the most votes was all of them. We thought they'd pick one and then we'd finish the next Kickstarter, we'd finish the miniseries and we'd go on that way. But they voted for all of them. So what we have coming up, we're launching July 9th on Kickstarter, is a chapter two of all five of these series. Very exciting. And and uh, as I said, all different genres. Um, one is sort of a godsend is like Jack Kirby meets the new gods. Uh, no, I mean, no, new god. I got it backwards. Jack Kirby meets Philip K. Dick meets The Matrix. That's my one liner on the on on Godsend. It's a story about personal identity, who we think we are versus who we really are. There's a supernatural western called Wisdom. There is um, uh, more tradition, uh, apparently more traditional superhero story called Any Man. But as you dig deeper into it, you see that it is less traditional than it than it seems. There is a, a a fantasy adventure that takes place in the afterlife called Layla in the Lands of After, and then there is sort of a I don't know how to, what would I call it? It's sort of a monster story, I guess, uh, called the Edward Gloom Mysteries, a little, little a modern day uh, Frankenstein kind of story. Uh, so they're all very, very different, which for me as a writer is a lot of fun to jump between all these different stories and flex a different muscle on each one of them. And so hopefully all the people that supported us the first time will come back. Anyone out there listening, if you didn't, if you weren't along for the ride the first time, we will be offering all the first books as well. And we did a beautiful collected edition that Liam Sharp did, um, did the cover for. We have great artists, Tom Mandrake on Wisdom, Sean McManus on Layla, David Baldion on Any Man. God Send, our first issue was done by Matthew Dasmith. We have a new artist. We haven't announced him yet, but he will announce that soon, taking over God Send. Uh, Edward Gloom Mysteries is uh, Vasilis Godzillas, a wonderful Greek artist. We, have, we haven't announced him yet either. Four amazing artists doing alternate covers. And I said, Liam is doing uh, he did the first collected edition. He'll be doing the cover for the second. A lot of great stuff. So I 
it's one of the most exciting projects I've ever been involved in in 40 plus years doing this. So I hope that that whether you were with us the first time or, or you're brand new to this July 9th Kickstarter, please come along. That's the first thing. <laughs> uh, Shadow wraps up in July. The first issue of my new Batman series, uh, uh, Robin Lives, comes out in July. That is uh, the exploration of what would have happened had Jason Todd not been killed by the Joker in that famous uh, Jim Starlin, Jim Aparo story. Having a lot of fun with that. Uh, I haven't written Batman in, in, in quite a few years, and it's been great because I, as I'm working on that miniseries, I also just wrapped up an episode of the new uh, Cape Crusader animated series that's on Amazon. So I, after not writing Batman for a long time, I was like, you know, swimming in Batman. You know, I was neck deep in Gotham City, and it's really fun because I love Batman. Any chance to write Batman um, is, 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 is fun for me. Um, let me think what else. I'm working on a new novella. I've had two novellas come out the past couple of years, one called The Excavator, one called The Witness. If you're a fan of my work, I hope you will go to Amazon and check them out because it's two. I think it's two of the best things I've ever written. And I'm working on the third one now, which I hope will be out end of the year, early next year. That's a lot right there. And we're already talking about we're already talking about the next Spider-Man series. So we know what it's going to be, but I can't tell you what it's going to be. <laughs> Well, um, that all sounds amazing. Um, I would love to have you back on to talk about your Kickstarter. So maybe we can plan for something for that. That sounds yeah. sound amazing. Um, sir, it's been an absolute honor to speak with you. Thank you so much. Great to talk to you as well. And I'm happy to come back anytime. Thank you so much. Have a great day. You too. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Vernon Stars podcast. So tell me about the algorithms by liking and subscribing. Be sure to for the next episode when Gary Anthony Williams Boards the mothership to discuss Batman Cape Crusader on Prime. The next voyage, travel on.